Great. Okay. Um, let's let's get going. So thank you again, everybody who's been able to make the time to join our webinar. Can loyalty programs reignite growth for multi-brand organizations? So next slide. Um, just quick introductions for all of us. So my name is Damayanti Perkayasta. I'm a consulting partner at Mamak Ogilvy um, in the growth and innovation practice. Let me introduce uh, the two experts that we have today's webinar. So we've got Aisha Rashid. She's the MD of growth and innovation at Mamak Ogilvy and pretty much my partner in crime. And we also have Yearn who is the VP of EMEA and lead strategist at Antavo, which is a global loyalty tech uh, solutions provider. So say hi, everybody, and say and wave. Hey. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so a couple of admin questions, admin things before we get started. So one, we want this to be as interactive and, and engaging as possible. So do feel free to pop any questions that you have throughout the webinar. You can put them on the question panel in the right-hand side overall go to webinar control panel. So just pop them in and I'll be looking, looking out for them as the webinar progresses. And uh, perhaps also top question on your mind, are you going to get the recording? And yes, you will. So we'll, uh, we'll look to send that across to everybody in about 24 hours. So listen to it at your leisure, share it with your colleagues and whoever else might be interested. So let's get started on today's webinar. So given everyone is here, either they're, you know, you're interested in loyalty programs, you know a lot about it. So let's actually give you a little trivia pop quiz. So we're actually going to do a little poll. So let me launch that right now. So the question is, when was the first loyalty program introduced? So choose from either 1920s, 1950s, or the 1700s. So I'll give you all a few seconds to choose your option, and then I'll share the results. Okay, so nearly two thirds have voted. You guys, a few more seconds. All right, 70%, last few people. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. So what were the results? So we've got 1920s, 30% uh, of you pick that, 48% pick 1950s, and 22% pick 1700s. So the answer, in fact, is 1700s. So uh, quite, quite remarkable. So a little bit of trivia for you. So it was actually when retailers give, gave copper tokens to customers so they could redeem on future purchases. So this was essentially the first frequent buyer program. And obviously it really paved the way for other industries and other companies. And so three, 300 years later, we have over 80% of companies having some sort of loyalty program and nearly half of their revenues coming from uh, members. So, you know, humble beginnings 300 years ago, which, you know, was surprising for us when we also discovered it. But, you know, it's a, it's a fun fact to get us started. So onwards to like setting the scene on you know why we're why we're talking about this topic and post pandemic is on everyone's mind next slide please and i think none more transformational than really than consumer behavior right so home has become the epicenter of work of life and and entertainment so a few stats from the region itself, we've seen that actually over two thirds of UAE customers, you know, not yet assuming any kind of normal out of home activities. And because everyone's at home, everything is being done online. And so McKinsey are actually saying that up to 45% net increase in intent to spend online even post COVID. So some habits that we're seeing now, you know, aren't gonna go away, they're actually here to stay. 
And so this seismic shift, um, a lot of economists are saying that we're actually entering this uh, K-shaped economy. So some businesses will be on the upward slope, some businesses will be on the downward slope. So, you know, it's quite a dramatic visualization of talking about winners and losers in this post-pandemic landscape. So just to kind of start things off would really, you know, see what your quick take is on, on this, you know, how have businesses from your experience, Aisha, and, and your, you know, try to avoid that downward slope of the K-shaped economy. So, uh, Damianta, yes, it's a, you know, it's a realistic, but unfortunately unpleasant, you know, picture. There are businesses and brands that, you know, have fulfilled a need for us all whilst we've, you know, been at home and have become household names, the likes of Zoom, of course, um, Disney Plus, food delivery services. Um, but others, to be honest, have been really losing money, you know, hand over fist. And you know, we've only just read about Emirates, for example, overnight in terms of their, you know, revenue slump. Um, which is really unprecedented and a lot of the brands that you know have been built on this concept of bringing people together so whether that's restaurants or cinemas you know airlines um, their businesses have totally you know ground to a halt so you know you're right in that this is not a typical economic recovery it is unprecedented and it's very the impact is very uneven and um, so really, um, from my point of view, success, failure over the next few months into next year is really going to be determined by a very different operating model that's all around agility and innovation. Yeah, completely agree. And what's your feeling on this, Jan? No, I mean, uh, honestly, it, economists predicting that there's going to be a K-shaped economy, this has been happening for a year now. So, um, you know, you call it unpleasant. Obviously, there are those winners that are on the on the upward slope of the K K shape economy. They're going to enjoy this, but the business that we've been talking to since the pandemic hit um, are really on both ends of this, and there are challenges on both ends of it. So there are those businesses you described, Aisha, um, really struggling to keep their customers. Um, these customers are trying new experiences, they're trying new brands, and they may never come back. So these customers, uh, these these businesses are really trying to find ways to to recreate that loyalty or to utilize the loyalty that they have in these customer segments to get them to come back now that the world is normalizing again. But likewise, those businesses that are getting this huge influx of customers you described, uh, you know, a few success stories, brands that we're all familiar with, they're equally um, trying to find ways to turn these new guest shoppers, I would say, like they're coming to visit you, but turn them into loyal customers that stay. Those challenges both persist and. Um, and while some custom, some businesses have really, you know, kind of do the the, the knee jerk reaction, you throw discounts at the problem, right? Throw money at the problem. Uh, others are really responding to this very differently and and smarter because there is an economic shock, sure, but customers are changing their behavior based on like preferences to shop online. You mentioned the statistics there, so you need to respond smarter with more agility, with incredible um, you know innovation. So we've had examples of loyalty programs that we supported. Um, completely hosted on a, a WeChat mini app. So you have um, social selling in store, video selling, all of that is integrated into loyalty experience, your status, all your information is available. So that's really smart because customers respond to that. And we're just also launching a program right now where a restaurant is incentivizing customers to use non-contact options. So curbside pickup, um, which is another thing that loyalty often does. It's 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 incentivizing customers or it's it's nudging customers to try new experiences, to try new business models and, and new services. Yeah, I mean those those are really great examples of of initiatives that are happening. Um, I mean to take it to the next level, have we seen any like fundamental like structural uh, changes that are happening, uh, business model changes to to address this new new world that we live in? Yeah, that, yeah, I think, you know, Daniel, you and I have seen, you know, clients sort of talking about ways of overhauling how they go to market. And I think, yeah. you know, what's relevant is how they deal first and foremost with some of these more complex or diverse brand portfolios that they have. Um, and I think, you know, the key overriding driver is for them to really, you know, ensure a stronger foothold in the sort of hearts and minds of, of consumers. and and really build around, you know, different or real moments that matter now. Um, it's interesting, Jan, that you uh, touched on WeChat, for example. Um, you know, something I was going to mention is that we see all sorts of um, 
ecosystems of brands emerging and, and a lot of these are coming out of Asia so some of these super apps that started with food delivery and now have gone on to do all sorts of you know lifestyle related um, services and and even airlines you know who, who'd have thought that they'd be spending more time now thinking of partnerships and collaborations with the likes of Disney plus rather than thinking about their own direct competition you know within their field and um you know it you know I, you can ask well are we ready for this you know some of these are literally just catching the wind and then I sort of thought about it and it's interesting because you know I'm using Kareem and Uber all the time now to to move around and the thought of not being able to connect that service to my smartphone you know I wouldn't know what to do so you know that app-based service has taken off so quickly it feels like for me it's been around for, you know for decades um, and I wouldn't have been able to live without it so I think that's a good example of how brands need to really get ahead of themselves think differently show up differently you know in all aspects of our lives whether it's work or play building communities um, and it's not going to be easy for them because certainly from you know um, you know, I feel I've become more fussier, more particular. You know, you can have a laugh and say maybe it's my my age, but um, we're just a whole lot more discerning. I'm not sure what you guys think or how you've changed your kind of consumption behaviour over the past year. Um, I don't know if it's just an age thing. I mean, from from my perspective, I, I definitely hold back on purchasing you know i think twice on whether it's something i really need or or want right now so being a lot more discerning and also if i if i do decide to make that purchase i'm thinking okay if, am i going to go to the default brand that i've always thought of or am i actually going to think about some of these new brands that are emerging in the space yeah yeah i mean i've Similarly, uh, I hope it's not just age, um, but yes, we, we are as consumers generally becoming a lot more demanding and, and discerning. And uh, when you say these new super apps are emerging and we're wondering, is this is this going to hold? Is, do we need this? Is this going to work? We had the same questions eight years ago about Uber. And now you say it's it's completely ingrained in everyone's life, these kind of services. We don't know. you know. So to me, it's not really a question, is this going to hold, but which ones kind of are going to win out? And um, and it's just it's it's evolving. The technology allows us to do these things. So this emotional connection, this um, delivering a need rather than promoting on price, this is something that that holds also in loyalty. So uh, loyalty programs, loyalty initiatives are getting much more into the emotional, much more to the experiential, much more into the service uh, element. And and whilst these like new services are emerging and customers are reorienting themselves. Having a loyal customer base is actually an incredible asset. So that's why a lot of companies are focusing on it. If you're branching out into a new service, if you want to deliver what you do in a different way, if you want to appeal to new segments, a loyal customer base that trusts you to go onto that journey with you, it's almost a prerequisite to uh, to stay competitive. Yeah, completely. I'm really glad that you kind of made that connection between what's going on in our landscape and how loyalty is a core growth driver that a lot of businesses can use um, and multi-brand organizations right are, are part of it they equally want a stronger hold in customer relationships but I mean, the reason why we're, we're laser focused on uh, multi-brand specifically for today's webinar is that you know whether they're starting out on a new loyalty program or whether they're reshaping an existing one we, I mean, we all gonna have a sense that the road that they're on is a little bit more bumpy than for other companies and so we just wanted to really tap into that and and explore it so for for the attendees the rest of the webinar we're going to focus on three key watch outs that we think are kind of the most important to really untangle for multi-brand organizations so let's start with uh, watch out number one so this is integration isn't always the answer so this is coming from a place where Multi-brand organizations, for them, a shared loyalty program, the model might be, you know, the default option or choice could be the full umbrella uh, integrated loyalty platform. But, I mean, is full integration always the answer for multi-brand organizations for a loyalty program? Are there other avenues available to them? I mean, uh, I could talk about the pros and cons of coalition loyalty but maybe Aisha 
I'm, I'm really curious to see your or hear your perspective on like from a brand strategy perspective first on, on, on how you think this will pan out. Throwing it to me, Ian, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, brands are, you know, for me, brands are unique. Um, and us as individuals, you know, as customers, consumers, we're individuals. So when you bring the two together, customer relationships are going, going to grow differently. Um, and what I've noticed within businesses and, and industries is that the driver for uh, integration is really driven around operational efficiencies and reducing business costs as opposed to thinking you know more customer centric or around the customer need first um, so I guess I would raise my hand to integration if it doesn't restrict the best way for that brand to really lean in and step into the customers sort of day-to-day -day circuit of life and you know, a couple of examples spring to mind um, in this region, um, and Damian, it'd be good to hear what you think. But you know, one um, is, is Majid Alpha Tame, who you know launched a sort of share program, which is integrated yeah. across really diverse lifestyle verticals. So, you know, leisure entertainment, you know, day-to-day -day grocery shopping, fine dining, hotel restaurants, uh, mall concepts. Um, but yet they seem to complement us because they find a place in our day and there's very little conflict in that. Um, and another or multiple points in our day, right? I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um, and another one is um, actually some work that we did at Ogilvy a while ago um, with a sort of Starwoods and Marriott bon, uh, Marriott Bonvoy programme, which if you look at that, they essentially trade in accommodation, which is one vertical. But then within that, they've been able to really create, you know, a diverse range of brand experiences that really do or are tailored to specific customer segments. So both of these brands are good examples of how they've able, they're able to keep the authenticity and the individual brand identity, but at the same time, offer a very holistic, seamless sort of loyalty experience or, or customer experience across, across the board. And um, so I think for me it's the, the essence of striving for authenticity and so when i think about that you know are there opportunities now we talked about agility before and having to be ahead that is it really about coming together when there is a market need and then otherwise not so um you know what i mean by that is catering to a market need or for a specific segment and building a proposition that focuses on you know position of strength so commonalities complementary ecosystems um you know i guess standards that work well between two brands and um ogilvy singapore has been doing a little bit of work with dbs which is a bank out there and what they've done is they've partnered with singapore airlines so that allows for you know vast array of sort of direct flight choices and then they partnered with expedia so you get the whole gamut of accommodation. They're then tied up with Chubb Insurance. So you get some of the foundational security needs. And it's you know all under one umbre umbrella, but it's it's that part of, of the banking. So it's you know, it's I guess a sort of horizontal type type alliance. Um, but I'm sure you and you'll correct me on that, you know, in terms of what that actually looks like structurally. So, you know, I find these types of setup really interesting and really relevant and they're there when you need them and then you can pull away from them you know recent example um was bmw tying up hooking up with um lv um because they've got you know in terms of their brand they've got an alignment around a purpose and a promise to offer craftsmanship and innovation and luxury so they've created a range of tailor-made um, luggage, for example. So it allows you to focus on the brand and it allows you to focus on innovation without having to worry about being too locked in. Um, but, you know, it'd be good to hear um, from a platform perspective whether that is ultimately the right way to go. Well, um, good question. Uh, I think, as, as with many of these questions, the answer is going to be it depends. So, um, let me maybe take a couple of minutes to, exp to, to, to talk a bit about the, the logic or why a coalition loyalty, um, as, you, as, as would be the technical term if you have multiple brands you know, organized within one loyalty program. Like, 
what's the point of it? Like, why does it, why does it exist? And what, what need does it serve? And to understand kind of where that's coming from, we need to like, put one clear stake in the ground. Um, the loyalty program ultimately is there to change customer behavior. Whether you want customers to shop a little more or to shop a little more from our brand or to engage a little more, we're trying to get customers to change their behavior. And to change customers' behavior with the loyalty program, you need to first get them to engage and to remember that they are in the loyalty program. And here's where you know we're getting straight away to one of the two issues that some loyalty programs are facing. Um, one would be that if you're in a, operating a business with, like, say, low frequency, you have one purchase transaction per year, customers are, are going to forget. They're going to forget that their benefits are available, that they even have any points balance, and that loyalty program becomes you know, forgotten and, and left behind the card. And the, the second issue, which is one of the biggest drivers of frustration of customers in loyalty programs, is if it takes you too long to actually get to a certain reward level, um, if you cannot redeem anything until you've done 50 purchases. And those two things are what's being overcome with a coalition loyalty program because you have multiple businesses working together you increase frequency you're quicker to reach status you're quicker to reach a reward and customers do that so it's transactional logic but it works for customers so we shouldn't forget that it really serves a purpose there um, i mean as a business you have you have additional benefits from collecting additional data you know out of category that you wouldn't know you build a, you build a better customer profile that way um, but there's also a downside to this. The downside is that you're almost, I would say, outsourcing the relationship to your most loyal customers to another organization. And are customers actually building a loyalty with you as a brand in the coalition loyalty, or are they building loyalty to the coalition? So to the Nectar card, to, you know, to share what you mentioned. And then, you know, um, does that mean you actually have any influence on this? What does it say about you as, as a business if you're outsourcing this key element of your of your customer strategy to another organization? So, um, you know, you, you got to weigh the pros and cons in, in a way. What you said, and I love the example from, the, from Singapore that you brought in, it's about does it make sense for these different brands that are in this organization to come together into a loyalty program? If, if as a multi-brand organization you have 16 different fashion brands because that's your expertise and they all go to the same customer, and they're competing with each other in instances, don't throw them into a coalition loyalty. It, it won't work. Um, so what I, what I think um, will emerge is more examples like you said, that where coalition loyalty actually is around a customer experience, a customer need, or a customer aspiration even. So uh, uh, for example, a coalition loyalty program around health. You know, why wouldn't a fitness app, um, a gym chain, a health insurance, an organic food store, why wouldn't these come together and help customers achieve a healthier lifestyle together? And then you're really getting to tap into emotional loyalty, and that's loyalty to the brands participating and not just the program. So I'm really looking forward to some of these models to like evolve and take their place. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, likewise, I think that kind of experience-led innovation sounds really interesting. I think you know, putting our Middle East hat on given that over 60% of the population in the region are millennials and a big chunk of them are hugely aspirational. I think that kind of uh, innovation and loyalty programs uh, would be you know, hugely exciting for them, I think would strike a chord in how they lead their their day-to-day -day life. So yeah, it should be, should be interesting to see. Hopefully there'll be some more developments in that space. Um, but, you know, moving on to our second watch out, you know, regardless of which path a shared loyalty program is going to take, uh, you know, one of the points that you mentioned, Jörn, is the access to data. Uh, brands will have access to more data on, you know, more potential customers. And that's one of the, the key sort of benefits of looking at a shared, shared loyalty program. But I think we're all, you know, quite aware and now appreciate that the, the promise of, of big data and personalization, you know, might not be living up to that potential for a lot of companies. So kind of that kind of spawned the idea of the second watch out, a lot of data, no insights, especially for multi-brand organizations when they're looking at shared loyalty programs. But before kind of handing it over to you guys to get your take, I actually want to do another poll with the with our attendees uh, on this particular point. So the poll is, is big data and personalization delivering on the promise for your loyalty program? So if you don't have a loyalty program, 
per se, then just think of it, think of the question related to your marketing activities. So select one of the following. We're not using personalization. It's not significantly delivering on the promise, delivering to some extent and fully delivering. So yeah, choose the option that's right for your company. Okay, we've got half of people voting, so choose that, choose that option. All right, I'll give you guys a few more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. So what we see is it's sort of evenly split around 20% that not significantly delivering on the program and fully delivering on the program. So that's that's heartening. But you know, nearly 50% of all you have said to some extent. So it's you know kind of a mixed bag, uh, which you know really resonates with the experiences that we're that we're seeing with our clients. But for multi-brand organizations who are trying to deal with this thorny issue probably more than than other companies, you know, what advice or what thoughts do do you guys have on how they can overcome this? Uh, I guess, um, I mean, I just, um, you know, posted in the chat that these seem to be better results than I, you know, I had in anticipated. Um, you know, I, I feel that there are some obvious challenges around data quality and, and systems limitations that kind of, you know, we end up struggling to get, I guess, the desired experience that, you know, we, we're, we're hoping we're hoping to have. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Gartner article around is personalization dead and, and dare I be controversial to say that perhaps I don't think that they're entirely wrong. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the quote was something around seven or eight or eight percent of marketers by 2025 and will abandon all their efforts on personalization due to, you know, lack of ROI. And I think you know, the basics of, of personalization are there and, and they work well in terms of, you know, um, personalization by name and recommending products and services and some right sizing and, and managing sort of the time of day and things like that. Um, but the next level, you know, again, which has um, become very starkly clear through COVID is, is the understanding, is the uncovering of the why. Um, so the more human centered aspect that can marry quite well with with data analytics. And the reason I bring that up actually is um, I'm not sure if if you guys or in fact anyone um, in the audience got to tune in on last Friday to Nudge Stock. So Nudge Stock is um, Ogilvy's annual. Oh, you did. Brilliant. Well done. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, so that's Ogilvy's annual behavioral science and creativity festival and it's you know spearheaded by the one and only Rory Sutherland and he you know always throws in some great one-liners for food for thought and has some really relevant provocation so you know I actually would urge people to to tune in I think you know you can download them on YouTube but you know just generally you know it impacts you know our lives and, and it, it's incredibly insightful a couple of the sort of statements that, that he rose um, um you know one of them being you know why data driven um isn't always about doing what the data says you should do which i thought was really interesting and that data driven isn't about you know taking the magic out of marketing and in fact you know today most business questions that we've all that we all face in our daily lives are actually more behavioral questions um and it's actually not about modeling behavior in in this year and beyond based on you know what we did in 2019 you know in a completely different place so i think it's an opportune time to inject a lot of creativity into some of our you know personalization efforts um and spending more time on you know uncovering the why and we get more and more clients asking us about these behavioral marketing interventions so whether that's you know around personalization or in fact helping to overcome barriers to successful loyalty programs and we see more and more interest in the paid subscription model so you know recently we worked with a bank invest tech to see how we could encourage more students to sign up so a real deep dive into barriers 
and drivers um, and looking at more left field type innovation in, in framing things. And there's some really lovely thinking about um, accruing benefits over a period of time. So the concept of you know, the effort reward theory and delayed gratification for something more relevant and worthwhile. So there's lots of different angles. I think, you know, go back to the question about um, data and, and not enough insights. I think it's just about weaving in um, consumer psychology when you're designing loyalty programs and, you know, it's a hybrid solution really now. Very different from back in the day, hey, Yen? <laughs> For sure. Just keep talking I about the age thing, Aisha. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, when we were just starting out our careers <laughs> in London, um, maybe you would have had a slightly different perspective on, on data. Um, so we're pouring over all those, you know, test results, direct Soldier. marketing. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but ultimately, like, where you started out, it sounded a little controversial, a little skeptical of, of data and personalization per se. But you know, the, the key message I think that we're getting to is not that data isn't useful or that personalization is necessarily that, but um, it's not as straightforward as taking past behavior and, and assuming that's what's going to happen again next time. And especially what we're talking about right now is a, is a period where customers are changing their, their preferences and, and, and the whole, you know, business ecosystem is kind of realigning uh, along different service experiences, et cetera. Taking data that is from a test in 2019 and, and putting that into place for a campaign in 2022, is not gonna work clearly um, because the parameters have shifted. So it's being smarter with it. And you know, I'm really a data-driven marketing person at heart. Um, that's how I learned it. And and I do believe data is really the lifeblood of, of of meaningful and uh, like successful activity as well. So I get to the point about behavioral in a second. So I think what we are focusing on um, at Antavo really is to allow organizations at different levels of that maturity to inject more data and to inject um, that behavioral insight into their loyalty programs. So we've built a lot of capabilities really around data, data collection and data connection, you know, incentivizing customers to share uh, either explicitly or, or implicitly about what they're doing, what they're preferring, uh, and making it part of the loyalty structure. But also, and here's the, the interesting part about behavioral science, but we've also built in capabilities to run um, loyalty experiences that like really appeal to the subconscious. And that's what I feel like is the nice thing about the behavioral science element. It, this will work even if preferences change because it's not wired to our actual conscious decision making. It's the it's the fast thinking element of the brain. So uh, when you can tap into those things, they are going to work even if like superficially um, uh, your behavioral or preferences will change. So um, I talked about changing custom behavior before, so that's really important. So again, we've cap we've got capabilities on the platform to do to deliver what you just talked about. You know, delayed gratification. Um, to take an example, we have a contest module where customers need to repeat certain actions multiple times to get there. So you have progress, you have achievement, you have delayed gratification, all these elements of gamification that come into play. We're running like limited access type rewards or exclusive access type rewards. So the fear of missing out comes in and really gets strong. Um, so uh, this this is really important and we're trying to build for the future. And, uh, and this is something that when you design the loyalty program, you really need to make sure you have these elements in place because they're incredibly important. Yes, and you know, just trying to summarize what both of you have been saying, and definitely doesn't sound like you guys are on like opposing sides of, of the boxing ring, but it's about how you use the data. And I think both of you are, are saying that in order to really influence people, you kind of need to add that magic back into, into, the, into how you use the data. And that's, and that's because you're gonna elicit emotion when you do that. And the emotion is that killer ingredient to, to change customer behavior. And then, you know, behavioral science is obviously one key tool. So all of that kind of just works well together. So it's something that, you know, we shouldn't shouldn't forget that it's about using the data to change behavior and emotion is a, is a key part of being able to do that. So let's move on to watch out number three, which is too much friction. So as we've just, chatted about, you know, issues with data can cause that friction. But if we just kind of like take a step back and look at uh, multi-brand shared loyalty programs in, in more general terms, you, if you think of what's, you know, what, what they're trying to achieve, 
this, these kind of programs working seamlessly um, kind of seems almost unattain unattainable. I mean, just, just the sheer complexity of what you're trying to do and what you're dealing with in all these different moving parts. So uh, maybe a bit controversial, but I mean, do you think multi-brand shared loyalty programs can actually be friction-free? Uh, Who wants to take this one? <laughs> no, sorry, Ian. I, you know, I, you go first again. It's okay. I, I, feel, I feel like there is, you know, there is a lot of friction, and I think the crux of it is that we really need to look at things slightly differently. So we need to look at the, you know, the customer journey and how consumers and brands interact, so how they enter and re-enter. Um, in meaningful ways um, and it doesn't really matter you know whether it's digital or not because we're just everywhere um, and I think the brands that have done this really well are really brave brands um, where they break down channels entirely and put customers in control of the shopping experience almost the producers of the process um, so you know there's brands in the US like Wal you know Walmarts and, and Target for example where they just simply are not allowed to talk channel first or website first um, because let's face it I mean do you do you say all right I'm going to go and do some omni-channel shopping now you know consumers don't shop omni-channel they just shop they want to browse and buy and they want to be serviced it's as simple as that they don't care they're not interested um, so that's one point and then I think secondly there is this sort of um, over marketing um, which are the natural tendency within the industry and particularly in this part of the world, which has created a lot of fatigue really and apathy, fatigue in for marketers and apathy with consumers and a lot of disengagement. And we know that from all the stats, I'm sure in the audience as well, those people that are familiar with loyalty will see all the stats that suggest that not many of us are particularly engaged in these programs. We might have enrolled in a many, but we're not active. And I think this over-reliance um, in price promotions and communications needs to be addressed more fundamentally. And so actually just stepping away and thinking, why am I pushing out price promotions and communications related to things like that? And actually start to look at, you know, widening the sort of gamut of, of loyalty. And, and we tend, at Ogilvy, we sort of foster a couple of other bonds within loyalty programs, not just financial and structural, but also social and emotional. So emotional being you know all about the connectivity with the brand and bringing out the brand personality and behavior and then social is really about you know connecting consumers with their passions and interests which would naturally forge a community which is much more distinctive and that's what drives advocacy and affinity so um you know i'm just obviously conscious of time but you know we've been able to manifest that with that sorry manifest that with a client um you know worldwide client Ford where they were having challenges during the pandemic with the lack of interaction at touch points and the apathy and distance from marketing programs where they really revamped their loyalty to be accessed through an app a, a, you know a CX focused app that became a versatile and flexible comms platform where not only could you do the transactional things but there was a lot around co-partnerships co-branding of credit cards you know, really interesting type reward schemes. And so they're really brave to go out and experiment and they've been able to extend that into the more lifestyle perspective around smart cities and so on. Um, really interesting case. Um, so, so I do think that this concept of too much friction it really needs a much, much more um, concrete and foundational review. It, it's not a superficial, let's just reduce the number of yeah, no, completely agree. Yeah, in the interest of time, as you said, and I feel like every one of these watchouts could be, uh, you know, a webinar in itself, to be honest. But um, <laughs> what you're saying, let me just shine the light a little bit on the on the what's behind the scenes on this, because to deliver something that is frictionless from a customer experience, there is also the reality of how do I deliver that, right? So, and and it's the programs that seem the most seamless and easy or the experience that seem the most seamless and easy that probably have the biggest work in the background happening to make them to make them come together because you need to think about obviously disparate IT systems and infrastructures that you have to connect so the data is available the data flows and, and people are informed because um, we said it before nothing is worse than bad personalization 
Um, you also have to think about uh, you know disparate organizations coming together. But um, just on the systems case of things, and, and let's shine a light maybe on an example of a multi-brand organization here. We've been working recently a lot with malls. Um, loyalty is a, is a real important topic in, in, that, in, in that sector at the moment. And if you visualize a mall, and they're obviously very popular in, in, in the Middle East, um, you go into a place where there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different retailers offering services all under one roof. And that means hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of disparate IT systems that have to be brought together to deliver a seamless customer experience. And in reality, that's unbelievably difficult. I mean, it's to the point where that's a key reason why it doesn't exist in many malls, because you, you can't get the systems to come together that easily, at least not real time. So, you know, um, these are the problems that we're trying to solve as well for our customers. And, and we've gone so far as to actually develop a little bit of, bit of hardware for this particular example I'm bringing up. We call it the Coalition Loyalty Hub. I think you've seen that, um, which is something you can install um, into a retail outlet in a mall. It doesn't need to be connected to the point of sale system. And you can deliver a, a seamless loyalty experience where customer information is visible to the shop assistant. All the loyalty details are available to the customer. They can pick rewards. Everything is, is seamless. And it actually allows this conversation um, with people where you can start influencing and nudging behavior, maybe doing that extra little cross-sell. Um, so that's something that overcomes the barriers. And these examples are really have to, have to come to place. Solutions to make these frictionless in the background, and especially for multi-brand organizations where you're looking at different organizations with different IT systems, with different people, different decision makers. So making it easy in the background that's the that's the real hard work to support what what you're saying that vision of frictionless customer experiences no perfect and i love how both of you kind of touched on like the three main dimensions about you know starting with the customer journey looking at the proposition injecting more kind of emotion social bonds and also looking at the very practical you know system issues that could create a much more seamless experience um and, you know, and just you know one final lighthearted point i think the, the quote of the webinar has, has got to be, from my perspective, Aisha's comment about uh, consumers don't omni-channel shop, they just shop. I think, it's, I think it's funny, but also very, very true. And I can definitely see us creating some t-shirt merchandise from it. So, you know, we could, we could you know, rich and retire from that. So, you know, it's something, it's, it's a next step for us coming out of this webinar. Um, Good night. I'm come. Uh, I'm conscious of, uh, of time. So what we want to do is, you know, we've talked about these three key watch outs and just want to uh, leave you guys with some key takeaways before we open it up to, to questions. Um, so the first one really about the kind of sense of urgency, as we said right at the beginning, there are these new consumer behaviors and habits that are forming now and here to stay. So there, I mean, it is really time to act now versus thinking about it happening in the future or dealing with it in the future yeah and then you know as i as i said i think differentiation in loyalty is, is really going to come by focusing on you know um social and emotional bonds and not in a frivolous way but really leading with with those that's what's going to entice consumers and, dr and drive the affinity that you're looking for and almost as a, as a consequence for platform businesses also to to not think that you're put into a corner it doesn't have to be coalition loyalty it doesn't have to be standalone loyalty it, it, you really need to rethink that proposition to the customer and there are there are, there's a it's it's a it's a sliding scale you can go all coalition you can go all the brands individually you can have in alliances important is you know um, find find the resources and the partner that you can have that flexibility that you can go either way um, as as things change and as you add more brands to the portfolio really great thank you um, thank you both for for joining on this little fireside chats about multi-brand loyalty programs um, attendees I hope you've found our conversation useful and thought-provoking but we'd we'd love to hear from you um, so you know, if you have any burning questions, please do drop them into that question panel. I'll just wait a couple of minutes uh, for people to, to type away and we'll take a couple of questions and uh, pose them to Yuren and Aisha in the hot seat. So yeah, what, what do you want to see? So first question, um, how do you see subscription programs play in this, in this context? Great question. Do you want to take that, Aisha? Or um, I, I mean, 
yeah, I mean, I'll start. I, I, I absolutely, I think paid subscription models is a way forward. I think, you know, you're putting the decision in the consumer's hand. They're choosing to buy into your brand. Um, they know what they're getting up front. Um, and then, you know, for businesses, you get a better, I guess, revenue predictability. Um, you get more opportunities for customer engagement because the consumer's already already bought in. Um, and I just I just think, you know, it's convenient as well. You know, I know that I like that brand. I know that that's, it gives me what I want. And so this is what it's going to look like. Um, but I also think subscription works not just for that brand's product, but it also works in terms of accessibility because you could get access to lots of other things through that subscription model. So in this world of hyperlocalization and convenience, I absolutely do believe that the structural evolution of loyalty programs is around this paid model. Yeah, I mean, definitely subscription models uh that they work they don't work for all purposes though so uh, i think this is a real great defensive strategy a subscription model is is a great way to you know protect your main customers from from leaving because once they've taken that subscription we, you know we all know amazon prime it's a real difficult argument to make to then shop anywhere else um but if you want to like attract new customers in they're not going to maybe straight go for subscription um so that's a bit of differentiation in there um but what you're saying um as a as a, as a segue also into cross-selling new services and bundling these together it, it just works um and um yeah for sure it's it's for the brand where it's right it can be incredibly powerful yeah and uh just someone else not not a question but just uh experience uh saying you know again it's not it's not a silver bullet for everything. And he's mentioned that subscription guilt is a real feeling. It's a it's a watch out. Again, something to take into account when you're looking at customer behavior for these kind of programs. A uh, couple of more questions, which are great. Um, really smart ones. So the next one is, is there a best way to strategize and build a loyalty program across competing multi-brands in the same business house? Very good question. A very complex question, to be honest. Um, <laughs> it's a good strategy for competing brands in the in a multi or multi brand house. So um, yeah, I'm 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 kind of have to refer a little bit back to the point I made earlier that if you if you're basically a conglomerate of competing brands and competing businesses uh, under one umbrella, I think to the outside world, to the customer facing, that it's it's tricky to find a logic on why that would become a coalition loyalty program. To be quite to be quite honest, so I think. Definitely do in the background everything that you can do to make it seamless, you know, um, great synergies, um, efficiencies, you use one platform probably to drive the different programs of different brands. But I think these are probably best alone um, standalone programs because they can then individually represent the different brand identities of those uh, of those businesses because they will all have a slightly different proposition in the market otherwise they wouldn't need to coexist uh, next to each other and to have that uh, bundled up together seems um, a challenge to me to be honest what do you think yeah, I mean I, I think you're right I think um, you need to really try and keep the brand purpose and the brand identities distinctive because um, that's a power that's what made them appealing and successful in the first place um, and you need to really try and reduce as much conflict as possible so I'm not sure that that like you say that would be ultimately be the right strategy in the first place yeah and it's it's a good question to really bring up the point that integration doesn't have to be for the full proposition of the program it can happen behind the scenes and at the back end which you mentioned so good i'm glad we i'm glad we could end on that question um which i think is kind of reflective of a lot of things that we've been talking about um so i want to give back everyone time in their day i do want to mention that someone has already suggested another next step for us that's not just about or will be merch and and t-shirts but someone is very interested specifically about loyalty programs for shopping malls so maybe we'll make a very special webinar just on that. So we, we can take that away as a bit of a to-do. Um, so yeah, with, with that said, I just want to thank you and Aisha for, for their great insights and provocative and controversial statements, and, but ultimately very fresh and insightful. And everyone who's on the call, uh, attendees, thank you for your time, uh, for listening and for your questions and contribution.
So thank you from Memak Ogilvy and, and Tavo. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank with you. that specific small question, please reach out. We're always here. There's yeah. contacts in the in, in the slide. So I'm happy to have that conversation even outside of where we are. But thanks for the yeah. inspiration as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.